Good morning. I'm okay, boy. Maybe I'll just wait until everybody comes in. I just he uh, Christian opened the door and I looked back there and they're across the parking lot, but they're coming. So, um, well, Christian's here. We'll go ahead and start. Pray for Tim. Uh, Tim is not. He's not hurt. He's preaching in Hollister today. That's why the kids don't have a Sunday school class. And uh, so, yeah, pray for him and his preaching. His uh, daughter just walked in, Kate, son-in-law. Yeah, I guess I'm going to wait. Now I look back there. A car, a car's driving up. I, I don't know who it is, but try to try to ad lib here for a little while. Uh, so anyway, nice to see you all, Kate. Your dad. We're just saying, talking about your dad. It's good. He is preaching in Hollister today, right? Is Owen not coming? He's with them. Owen's sick. He doesn't even get to hear his dad preach. All right. Well, we're in Colossians. We'll go ahead and you know talk, and I'll give a little uh, uh, intro from chapter two. We're in Colossians chapter three. I said chapter two. I, it was Colossians chapter three, and I was going to lead into it from chapter two, and it's not chapter two. It's just previous verses from chapter three. And starting, look at verse number five. We we talked a little bit about it last week. He says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. So he's saying, listen, this put off all these things. Don't do these things. These are evil, awful things that are against God. They're sins. And when you look at the... the uh, uh, the things he mentions, these are big, what we would think of as big sins and awful sins, uh, and, and they shouldn't be part of a Christian's life. He says they used to do those things, uh, the Colossians, whether it was they were uh, Jews or Gentiles, before they came to know Christ, that's the way they lived. And so he goes on now from chapter 7, uh, beginning in chapter 8, and he says, but now, now that you have been born again, now that you're saved, now that you are a new creation, put off, uh, also put off all these. And now he he lists some things that, yeah, they just, we look at it and say, well, I get mad. He says, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Uh, all of these things that just, or maybe they don't look as bad as what, how people look at these other sins. But that's why I think he uses the term but. Okay, this is the way you were. And Leslie's the only one that went in there because she thinks there's a Sunday school class. No Sunday school class in there, Jose. She'll, she'll figure it out, I think. And then come, come back in here. But he uses the word but there. He says, these are the, this is the way you used to live. And these are the bad things that you are not to, not to continue doing. And so he says, "That's you understand that. But now, these other things that you don't think are so bad, you know, put those away too. Stop that. He says, and that's what he, he says, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. He goes on to say, lie not one to another. Why, why would he tell them that? We do it. Yeah, people lie, right? And even Christian, you ever hear a Christian lie? <laughs> Isn't that awful? We're going to talk about uh, uh, bearing false witness. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, the, one of the Ten Commandments. We'll look at that this morning in the morning service. But he says, he tells them, don't lie to one another. Yeah, I know some people say, well, since we're Christians, we're not to lie to each other. But we can lie to other people. We can lie to unsaved. What kind of thinking is that? Uh, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek 
nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So he says, once we put our faith in Christ, we have to understand, we have to look at our relationships with other Christians. There is no difference between us in our spiritual condition. We can look around, I can look around, I can see different nationalities, different races, uh, we have different languages, different sexes, only two, by the way. <laughs> and, but, okay, there are these differences, but before God, he looks past the physical. He looks at the heart, and we're all the same. And we have the same responsibilities one to another. And Paul talks about putting off these things. And we're going to look at these, starting verse number 8. Put off all these. There are things that, that are in our lives that, that separate us from God in fellowship. And that's sin. So he says, put these off and be separated from them. Go back to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 11. What Paul is dealing with is sanctification for the Christian. We are to be... now. Okay, who can tell me? Raise your hand. I'll just shout it out. Thank you. Jo Joaquin raised his hand. I'm going to call on him after I ask the question. No. What does sanctification mean? Somebody? All right. Juan. I sh what? You're not. I, I don't have good ears. Set apart. To be apart from. Okay, so what Paul is dealing with says you've got to put off these things. Set yourself apart from them. Leviticus 11, look at verse number 44. God says, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile, defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth your, uh, you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. The word holy is the, the uh, condition of being apart. Sanctifying is being set apart. Okay, Once we are set apart, and that's what he says, you need to be holy. You need to be apart. <laughs> that's one word. Apart from sin. Be connected to God apart from sin. And, and when we are connected to God apart from sin, then we are holy. So he says, be ye holy. Sanctify yourselves. Can we sanctify ourselves and be holy? Not without God. So when he says sanctify yourselves, he says, look, you're, you're, you need to be working towards being like me. And that's what we call progressive sanctification. Slowly but surely, as we grow in our lives and we learn more of Scripture and what God wants and expects from us, we are more and more set apart for Him, sanctified. Uh, as we do that, he, he says, you are to be holy. We will not be completely, absolutely holy in this life, but he looks at us as being holy because of what Jesus Christ did for us. Jesus is holy. Absolutely. So back in Colossians chapter 3, we look at verse number 8. He says, put off these things. And now we need to look at this and say, okay, what? how do I fit? How do I fit in these things? If I'm going to put off these things, what in my life do I partake of 
Now, when I say partake of, is these are just actions uh, that happen inside, okay? Anger. How many of you have never, ever been angry? Joaquin, put your hand down. No, he didn't put it up. <laughs> we know that we get angry. Now, there are some times when we get angry for good reason. And the Bible does say, be angry and sin not. So we can be angry at sin. We can be angry for a good reason. Does God get angry? Right. Okay. So uh, if he gets angry, then and we have, because we are made in his image, there are times that we can be angry uh, for a, a good reason or a right reason. It's what we do with it and how we allow it to affect our hearts that is important also. And that's what the next couple of words are uh, talking about. Anger, wrath, and malice. It's like a progression uh, beginning with getting angry. If we don't handle our anger properly, then it gets deeper and more um, embedded in us when it turns into wrath. Okay, let's look at the words for just a minute. Uh, look at uh, anger, first of all, is, is, is even if it's good anger, we've got to deal with it. But then we can be angry for a bad reason also. And if we don't deal with it properly, confess the sin quickly, it can grow inside and what is called festering. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And look at, in, in, in verse number 26, it's uh, what I just quoted a little bit ago. It says, be angry and sin not. Now, he doesn't stop there. He goes on because he, I believe he knows he, he continues on because uh, he knows if we don't deal with the anger properly, then it gets worse and worse. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. If we get angry in the morning, you get to work and something goes wrong and you get mad, you can be mad all day long. Uh, mad at yourself or mad at somebody else. When it says, let not the sun go down, it doesn't necessarily mean the sun setting. Okay, it means don't let it go on, especially overnight. Get it taken care of as soon as you can. And that's what uh, one of the things we, uh, Jerry and I discussed before or when we got married, before or after. Uh, we're not, we're going to make sure it's not always doesn't always fit and doesn't always work. Uh, we want to make sure there was everything was between us well and good when we went to bed and went to sleep because we don't want to wake up feeling that anger because it turns into wrath. It turns into something worse. Wrath is, a, 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 I'll say, a deeper and a hotter form of, of anger. And again, God, when he punishes sinners, those people who never accept Christ as their Savior, they end up in the lake of fire, and they are partakers of his, the Bible says, wrath. Not just his anger, but his wrath. Uh, you, I say you when I'm ta talking about the people who are ending up in the lake of fire, they have had ample opportunity to receive Jesus Christ, to come to God through God's way. And God is angry with sin, but if they never turn to Christ, they are, how do I put it? Um, Hebrews chapter 10, I believe, tells us that uh, they have... Um, trampled underfoot the blood of Christ. And that is that that is a serious thing. And his wrath is going to punish them. But we 
shouldn't let that let that uh, build into us and get us to uh, uh, to that point. Our anger get get it taken care of. Go back to the book of Genesis, Genesis thirty four. If we don't control it, and I know we we look at this and say, well, that will never happen <laughs> because I'm not that quote unquote bad. Somebody said that uh, every person under the right conditions can do anything, uh, anything bad. I'm talking about sin in a heinous way. Depending on the circumstances, depending on how we deal with our anger, how we deal with the sin in the first place. The more we sin, the more we allow sin in our lives, the easier it is to continue. We don't get in trouble. Nobody sees us, so let's just, I mean, I'm going to continue on. Genesis chapter 34, look at verse number 25. This is when um, Jacob's two sons, um, trying to think of uh, Simeon and, and uh, Levi, did this because uh, Shechem raped their brother, and they said, well, we'll make a league with you, and if you will be circumcised, then we can marry your daughters, and you can marry our daughters, and we can have fellowship. So they did. All these men of this city were circumcised, and this is where we are. It says, and it came to pass on the third day when they were sore, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. And they slew Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. They got angry. They got so angry that we're going to kill these people. And like I said, uh, oh, I, I wouldn't do that. How do we know? If we don't deal with sin when we're supposed to, we don't know what will happen as time goes on. Because the, the old man, the old nature is still in us. And he's liable to do anything. So he says uh, back in uh, Colossians 3, anger, wrath, and malice. Malice. Malice uh, grows, it's deeper and, uh, in, in us, deeper and deeper. The anger builds up into wrath and we can do anything evil, but the malice gets, grows even deeper and uh, it grows into bitterness. Bitterness that we, it, it, it's harder to take care of, it's harder to deal with. Uh, we justify ourselves, justify our thoughts. This person did this to me, and there's no excuse for it. And I'll never forgive them. And we grow bitter and bitter in our hearts. Look at verse number um, 19. Boy, this is, this is scary. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Wow. Why? Why does he say that? I don't know what's different about a husband and wife relationship. He doesn't say uh, employers uh, love your employees and be not bitter against them. He doesn't say employees love your employers and be not bitter against them. He says husbands love your wives. I've said this often. Uh, it, here's where it says, tells God tells us, husbands love your wives. It never says God, that God says, wives love your husbands. But it does tell us that the women, older women, are to teach their, the younger women to love their husbands. So the fact is, wives are to love their husbands also. And I'll go, go along with this, and be not bitter against them. Uh, when something goes wrong and, and difficulty in a relationship, whether it's husband and wife, or like I said, employee or employer, uh, children and parents, we need to fix it fast. Because if we don't, then it grows deeper and deeper and be bitterness. Somebody, somebody said this, and it's, it, uh, 
I think it was Matthew Henry, uh, and and the the words he uses might sound foreign to us, not foreign as in another language, but um, we don't say it this way anymore. But let me read what he said. It's not very long. Uh, he says, "Many who are polite abroad are rude and bitter at home, because they are not afraid to be so there." Okay, abroad. Talking about when they're abroad means outside of your home. You're polite. That that that's you're polite when you're around other people, and I know we don't. Uh, if I'm angry with my wife, if okay, that's a it's a big word. Okay, capital I, capital F. If I'm angry with my wife, I don't I don't come to church and I'm angry with everybody else. I don't show my anger. Now that is a big if because I'm I don't think that I have ever been angry with my wife when I came to church to preach, okay? I just, <laughs> I don't come and put on a show. And this is what, what this person is saying. People are, are uh, polite when they're away from their home and away from the people who are whom they're close to. But when they get angry, they'll show it to the people at home. We call that two-faced, hypocritical. And uh, that should not be. It's easier to be bitter and angry at people that we know close, that we know familiar. And, and, and it sh they should be the ones that we love and treat best, right? Then Paul goes on in the, uh, the passage here. He talks about using our tongues properly. He says, to put off blasphemy. What is the general, general I say, and it's not just with God, what is the general meaning of blasphemy? Anybody? When we think of blasphemy, we think specifically of talking bad about God. But the word isn't just about God. It's a, it's a bad sin to, to blaspheme God. What it means is casting a bad picture on a, the character of somebody. Speaking evil about somebody. So blasphemy, you can blaspheme me. No, you can't. You're not supposed to. I'm not giving you permission, okay? But you can. You can... You can put doubt in somebody else's mind about the character of another person. That's blasphemy. So when we speak of somebody else, when we talk about somebody else, we should be speaking well of them, not evil. Blasphemy is slander. Any speech that hurts the reputation of another person. Be careful how we talk about one another how we talk about even other people. Like I said, it's talking about the use of our tongue now. Blasphemy. And then he says filthy communication. Filthy communication. Um, we can think of all kinds of things, whether it's bad language, bad words, or, or uh, just speaking evil of somebody else, or talking about the wrong types of things. Uh, things that shouldn't be talked about. A filthy communication. He goes on to say, lie not one to another. So n neither one of those things should be the part of a, the, the mouth, coming out of the mouth of a Christian. Why would that be? Lie not one to another. Well, he says, seeing that ye have put off the old man. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you should have been saying in your own heart, not to anybody else, not necessarily. Some people have to hear somebody pray, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, or Lord, come into my heart. You know, it's not, it doesn't matter if we hear it, it doesn't matter if anybody else hears it. It's what's in the heart when somebody puts their faith in Jesus Christ. The purpose is not just to have safety for eternal life, but it's recognition that the way I've been living, the things that are in my heart, the way I, 
I talk, the way I uh, treat people, all of the things that I have done in my life, the sins that have been committed, I say, these are wrong against my God. And I repent of those things. And so the old man is being put off or cast down, thrown away. That's, the per that's what has happened. That's what should be happening when somebody comes to faith in Christ. If they say, I'm going to accept Christ, and this is what some people would call easy believism. Because Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Okay, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. Paid the penalty for my sin. I believe he rose from the dead. There you are. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why do you believe that? What is your purpose in coming to that conclusion? Just so you can have eternal life, you're safe from the lake of fire? Or because you recognize you are an enemy of God and you need to come to God through Christ and be his friend now? Be a child of God. That's putting off the old man. Putting off the old man means we've discarded the old way of life. We've discarded the old actions. And a lot of, we, we, we miss out on this sometimes. Not just discarding the old actions, but discarding the old way of thinking. It's a whole new way of thinking. Do you think the same way a horse does? No. No. But if a horse became a man, how would he think? Like a man. Look what he says in verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Renewed in knowledge. I have a new way of thinking. I have new knowledge. I'm gaining new knowledge as I grow to know God better. And so, and, and as I get to know God better, this whole process of sanctification gets uh, growing and growing. I am putting off these things. And, and as we grow in Christ, we, we recognize there are more things that are sin than I knew when I per first came to know Christ as my Savior. You talk to people who don't know Christ, as well, I'm not a sinner. You ever talk to somebody like that? I'm not a sinner. What do they think is a sin? Murder? Adultery? Which is worse? I've, I've said this many times, I know. Which is worse? Stealing a million dollars or stealing a penny? Same thing. Why is that? Stealing is stealing. Thou shalt not steal. Okay? So, But the world thinks only of the big things. And so many times when we come to faith in Christ, we think the big things. Oh, maybe I wasn't a, an adulterer. I wasn't a thief. Uh, although most of us, I, I shan't, shouldn't say most of us. You know, and I say most of people, I think they look at me and say, well, it's probably just him. It's not everybody else. Um, I'm, I'm admitting some things when I say things like that. Uh, before I came to know Christ, I stole something when I was like four years old. I remember it. My mom didn't like it. I mean, she made me give it back and talk to the owner of the store. Where, where was I going with this? When we come to know Christ, we come to faith in Christ, and come to the point where we say, I accept Christ, we look at our lives and say, okay, I remember these things, these sins that I've committed. But there are a lot of little things that are easily done by us that we don't realize our sins. And that's growing in Christ. We say, this is something. And it's our thoughts, many times, that we don't realize are sinful. So he tells us to put off these things. Why would, when, what would make somebody lie to somebody else? Any, any, uh, I mean, just, just, uh, a, why, why would, I, I don't want to say why, it's, it's, how would somebody go about lying to somebody else? What's the, what's the process? 
it's hard to, I'm, I'm trying to avoid telling you what I'm thinking of, okay? Not getting in trouble, but before they, before they lie, all right, I'll, I'll just go ahead. They thought about it. I don't want to get in trouble. So they think about it and say, I don't want to get in trouble, so I'm going to do it. So before they actually lie, they decide to lie. Their thoughts are wrong. Now, we can, we can think about lying, and it's still not a lie. It's a temptation. Was Jesus tempted? Jesus was tempted a, a lot. You know, we, we look at the temptation of Christ in Matthew and, uh, chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, and we think of three times he was tempted. Now, he was tempted his whole life just like we are, but he never sinned. So temptation is not sin. Submitting to the temptation is sin. So, But we need to learn how to think before we sin. It comes on from our thinking. Verse number 11, he says, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond, nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Like I said, there's no differences in our, our races, you know, and it, and it comes down to there's no differences between. Now, be careful. I don't 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 conclude something before I finish. There is no difference between Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, Catholics who are born again. Okay. I don't doubt that there are many Presbyterians who are born again. You can, you can go farther and farther into other religions that are false religions, and it gets, it gets to be fewer and fewer truly born-again people because their doctrine is so far off. But God looks at our hearts and says, this person's a Christian. This person is a child of God. And he might look over in, in, in a, a church across town, and he says, this person is born again. Now, we might have some other beliefs, but before God, we stand as his children, and there's no difference. Put off these awful things. Stop doing these things. Don't worry about being a, a Jew or an, a non-Jew. Don't worry about being a, a, a man or a woman as far as Christianity goes. Be concerned about it, and don't, you know, being a woman or a man. But... Uh, before God, you're still a Christian. God doesn't look at women as being second-class citizens or second-class Christians. Look at verse number 12. Since I'm putting off these things, what am I supposed to do? Put on. If you, did you, when you got up this morning, you took off your pajamas, and, uh, and then what did you do? You put on something else. You don't go out just by taking off things and go outside and uh, go downtown to the store. You put on something else. And so if we're putting off the bad and evil things, we are to put on the righteous things. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. That's important, I think, to recognize that we are holy and beloved children of God, loved of God. And so if he loves us, he gave us new life through Christ, he wants us to be obedient, obedient children. Uh, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. You know, that's uh, the forgiving part is what I want to deal with. Uh uh, I'm supposed to put off the bad things and put on these things. Mercy. Have this these bowels of mercy. and it, it just means to be merciful to other people. To have the right attitude toward other people. When you're, when you're long-suffering, he talks about being long-suffering there. Uh, forbearing one another. You know, they're all related here. Because... 
Other people can irritate us. And we need to put up with them like God puts up with you. Right? It says forgiving one another. When we... We need to have a forgiving spirit. Sometimes it is difficult to forgive. But when you think about what God has done for us in forgiving us, when you and, and it's it's sometimes difficult to really understand the difference between us and our sin, between that and God. God is so absolutely good, infinitely righteous, that even stealing that one little penny makes a person end up in a lake of fire if he doesn't accept Christ as his Savior. But Christ paid the penalty for that stealing of a penny. So he doesn't go to the lake of fire for stealing the penny. He goes to the lake of fire for rejecting Christ. That's because the, 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 the difference between sin and God is so great. When we come to know Christ as our Savior, we don't understand things like that. We don't understand even how good God is. And as we grow in our relationship with God, then our, our, our understanding of God's goodness grows. And we realize how much he did for us in Jesus Christ. And so when, when we talk about him forgiving us, because we put our faith in Christ, we are forgiven of all of our sins. And that, that means sins that I'm going to commit tomorrow and the next day. That doesn't mean that I'm free to sin. It means that those sins are paid for. And God has forgiven me. So when, it's, when he says here, forgiving one another, when do we forgive other people? It's not when they sin against us. It's when they repent. But see, the problem we have is that it's so, it's so awful what they did to us. We're still angry and, or we get to that point of being bitter. And we're not willing to forgive. So when we, we are to forgive, yes, they are to repent. But their actions against us should not be so we should not be dwelling on it to the point where we're not going to forgive when they repent our hearts should be soft forbearing long suffering merciful just like he's saying all of these things ready at any time if that person comes and says I'm sorry would you forgive me boom it's over my heart is ready to forgive and I forgive and now we have the proper relationship one to another again that's exactly what God is doing for us every time we sin we need to go to God and say Lord I repent I'm sorry I have sinned against you what does the Bible say if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We're forgiven, but when we come to him and say we've, for, we've sinned, then we've restored the fellowship. So these, these are the things that he's saying. Put these things on. This should be part of your life. Ready at all times to forgive one another. So when, when it time comes, forgiving one another. Always ready. Verse 14. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. What is charity? Does it mean we need to give to uh, Salvation Army? Give to Goodwill? 
Put on charity. No, charity is love. Love. And it, when we love, and that's why Jesus said it and Paul said it, God gave us the commandments. Love God, number one, and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else fits. And so when we recognize that that person who has harmed me or treated me rotten, when I love that person, I'm ready to forgive. And so when he loves me and realizes what he's done, he comes and repents. He says, I repent or I, I'm sorry of what I have did. Please forgive me. We have that relationship of love one to another. Forgiving one another. Loving one another. Jesus, when he was being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Did he forgive everybody? Not necessarily. At the same time, the forgiveness is there. The, pay, the sins are paid for. Jesus took care of that. But people don't always come and, and make use of God's forgiveness. The sins are paid for. So they don't go to hell for their sins. They go to hell because they rejected Jesus Christ. But Jesus called out, Father, forgive them. They don't know. He says, they don't know what they do. They know not what they do. What they're doing is just continuing on that wide path that leads to destruction. And if they would realize what they're doing, they would come and receive Jesus Christ. We got more to go on here, but we'll stop right there and uh, continue on next week. All right, let's have a word of prayer and you'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love. Thank you for watching over us. Lord, thank you for the change that was made in our lives when we trusted Christ. Lord, help us to work out that change to be the new creation that we should be, putting off the old ways and putting on the new. Thank you for your word that explains these things to us and gives us uh, the knowledge of what you want. Guide us now as we uh, go into our worship service. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.